Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, and for taking time out of your uh, Thursday afternoon to talk all about practicing banjo. Um, I personally uh, love talking about all this stuff, so it's always great to have an interested audience. And hopefully at the end of this workshop, uh, you'll find your time here to have been well spent. So like the title says, um, this workshop is going to be about nine ways to practice smarter or to help you get the most bang for your practicing buck. And in addition, um, I'll be covering the uh, key mistakes that people make when trying to learn music. And uh, even though most folks watching this right now are probably banjo players, these uh, principles here apply to learning any musical instrument or really to learning of any kind. So let's get started. So, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Dr. Josh Turknet. I'm the founder of BrainJo, a company that creates uh, musical instruction that's designed to maximize the uh, learning ability of the adult brain. So, I have a long uh, background in the area of behavioral and cognitive neuroscience, and specifically in the science of uh, how the brain learns. So I've been uh, geeking out on this stuff I'll be talking about today for a very long time. And one of the most fascinating things about the human brain is that it can reshape itself throughout the course of our lives. So this is a phenomenon known as neuroplasticity, or also plastic brain. As like plastic, our brain is flexible and capable of remolding itself uh, in accordance to our needs in order to learn new complex skills and behaviors throughout our lives. And for a long time, we used to think that this ability to restructure our brain was uh, mainly or entirely limited to childhood. And we now know for certain that this is completely wrong. So one of my primary missions over the past couple of decades has been to apply our understanding of how our brain does this to the process of learning music. So there's been a big bias uh, over a long time that musical ability is innate and that some people are musical and some aren't. And this is totally bogus. Um, I wrote a column about this subject for several years in the Man Banjo newsletter, and I now write a monthly series for the Banjo Hangout called The Laws of Banjo, where I uh, cover a lot of these concepts. And uh, more recently, I founded Banjo, um, which, I, as I said, is a company that creates musical instruction that incorporates how the brain learns to create the most efficient and effective path for learning a musical instrument regardless of someone's age or prior musical experience. And using the system that I now teach as the Brainjo method, I've personally been able to learn multiple instruments in multiple styles and play in several bands with not a lot of practice time. And I've been able to learn the various down and up picking styles of banjo like minstrel and clawhammer and uh, scruggs or bluegrass banjo and then the old time two and three finger styles along with uh, things like flat picking and finger style guitar, uh, fiddle, piano, and so on. And again, this has nothing to do with me being unique or special, but rather because I'm using a system that maximizes the brain's ability to learn anything, including music. And I fully believe that anyone else can do the same by using that same system. So the Brainjo method was created to solve a particular problem, which is this. 
The science of the human brain tells us that everyone should be able to learn to play music, including the banjo, at a high level. And they should be able to learn to do so at any age because it relies on biological properties of the brain that we all have. But the statistics tell another story, which is that almost everyone who starts out to play a musical instrument doesn't make it very far. Most people may make a bit of progress early on and then reach a plateau where they stop improving or they don't know what to do to get better and then they quit altogether. So in the end, only a small fraction of those who started out learning to play music, including learning to play the banjo, actually make it. So here's what learning, here's what learning a musical instrument uh, should look like. And so you start out uh, in the beginning knowing nothing. Um, and then there's this nice uh, steady climb as you continue to develop skills and expertise uh, and you move from the beginner to the intermediate and then the advanced levels. And the problem is this is more like what usually happens. So folks may start out in the beginning doing pretty well and making some bit of progress and then they tend to get stuck a little bit and they may progress a little bit more but fairly quickly uh, things start slowing down a lot until ultimately they get stuck and um, usually you know get stuck around this late intermediate or I mean late beginner or early intermediate level and really don't know what to do to move past it and it's this lack of progress that leads to frustration which leads to most people giving up so the question is why is this the most common outcome right I said earlier that everyone should be able to reach those higher levels uh, and, and be able to play the banjo or any other instrument really well because doing so is grounded in biological properties of the brain that we all share. But if that's true, then why is the most common story one of stagnation, frustration, and failure? And I think there are, in my opinion, two primary reasons for this. One is that all the instruction, or most all of the instruction that's out there, is, is uh, based on uh, the classical method. So, or based on or borrowed from the teaching method for classical music. But classical music is very different from folk music, which is what almost everyone who takes up an instrument, including the banjo, is going to be playing. So in general, we can divide the world of music into classical and folk music. And the goal of a classical musician is to play by rote, which means to be able to take music that's in written notation and play that music exactly as it's written on the page. So classical music came about long before there was recorded music. And so if you're trying to make sure an entire symphony of musicians are playing the same thing, you need a system for doing so. So written notation was developed to solve that problem. And so then you need musicians who are able to read that notation and play it precisely as it's written. However, almost all other music is played by ear and includes the need to do things like improvisation, flexibility, individual interpretation, and the need to alter playing to particular musical situations. So the set of skills a, musicians must, a musician must learn for each of these different types of music are entirely different. But the model that most folk instruction is using is the classical method, not because it's the best one for, that pur for those purposes, but because it's been around the longest and it's the most well-developed teaching model for music. And then the second reason why most folks don't end up getting where they want to in learning music, and perhaps the biggest reason, is that there's little or no attention placed on the learning process itself. So from what we know in the field of musical expertise, Success is de determined or driven almost entirely by how we practice. Yet almost all instruction neglects this altogether, only showing what to practice. And what typically happens is that most people stop getting better because getting better becomes biologically to do so uh, because of the manner in which they've learned and practiced. And once you start heading down one of these wrong paths, it's really hard to get back on track especially if you aren't aware that you're on the wrong path to begin with. And the research also shows that, not surprisingly, most people use very ineffective practice techniques, largely because the specifics of how to practice are almost never addressed in instruction. And this sort of thing drives me crazy.
So why is the learning process so important? Every complex skill is based on the operation of a huge number of neural networks of increasing sophistication. And all of those networks we create in our brain when we practice. So this is a bottom-up process, and the order in which you create the networks is critical to your success. And the most effective procedure to construct the brain networks required to play the banjo is to break the process into the smallest learnable chunks, learn each chunk individually, and then move on when you've learned it well. Ultimately, you're only as good as the neural networks that you build through practice. So if you continue building high-quality neural networks in the right sequence, then mastery is inevitable. If you build low-quality neural networks in the wrong sequence, then mastery is biologically impossible and stagnation is inevitable. <clears throat> so the fundamental problem here is that there are far more wrong learning paths to creating the brain of an expert banjo player than there are right ones. And one of those wrong paths, and the most common one, is trying to build the neural networks that a classical musician would need to suit his or her goals, rather than the neural networks that a banjo player or anyone playing in a folk tradition would need to suit, suit their goals. And once you start heading down a wrong path like this, success becomes biologically impossible. So the goal of practice and the goal of the Brainjo method, which is what the brain, uh, Breakthrough Banjo courses are based on, is to eliminate those paths to stagnation, leaving just the ones that lead to success and will take you where you want to go. So with that in mind, I'm now going to give you the nine keys to helping ensure that you continue along that path of progress. So the first key, as you might imagine, is to learn in the right sequence. Now, one of the best models we have for learning music, or simply learning in general, are the developmental milestones of childhood. So this is one of the milestone charts that are often given to parents of small children and that are also the, the source of great anxiety and consternation. Um, so this is, uh, the, uh, this is one of those uh, milestone charts because we know that there's a set of skills that every child acquires during infancy and early childhood. And one of those skills is language. And we know that every child essentially moves through the same exact progression of skills when learning a language. And that's the whole reason why we can create a milestone char chart is because this progression is so stereotyped. And the reason the brain comes programmed to do this and to move through this progression is because these skills are incredibly important to becoming a functioning adult human. So over the course of a couple of hundred thousand years, Mother Nature has developed this foolproof model for learning how to talk. And the model for learning your mother language is particularly well suited for learning how to play music as well. It's essentially the perfect or ideal roadmap for how to learn anything, including how to learn music, as fluency in language and fluency in music are fundamentally very similar things. And some of the key points from, the uh, from this language model are number one, that there's a well-defined script and order to it. So every child starts by babbling vowel sounds, not by trying to form complete sentences. You never hear a child trying to speak in sentences before they've learned their vowel sounds, even though this sort of thing is done all the time when people try to learn music. Uh, another key point is that the skills that a child is working on at any given time depends entirely on where they are in the timeline. Also, the, the uh, construction here is, again, bottom-up, starting from the most basic uh, uh, the, uh, skills needed and moving to ones of increasing sophistication. So they take one new skill, they work on it obsessively, failing a good bit along the way until they have it down, and then they move to the next skill in the progression. Another key feature is that listening is a huge part of the process. So a child doesn't even make any attempt at speech until they've spent several months listening to the sounds of their native tongue. And that's something we'll come back to again in a, in a minute. So I said I'll be covering some of the uh, common mistakes as well, and one of those big mistakes people make is just learning in the wrong sequence. As I said, no child learns, try, starts trying to learn to speak in sentences before they've mastered their vowel sounds. Yet you see this type of disordered approach uh, when learning music all the time. So the big picture overview of the uh, entire learning pro process is to take all the skills needed, break them down into a logical sequence, 
learn them until they become automatic, which means they can be performed while the conscious mind is focusing on something else, and then move to the next skill in the progression. And so a fundamental part of the brain joke course design is this sequence of learning, which has been very carefully chosen to ensure that you're working on the right skills in the right order. <clears throat> on that note, the uh, second key is to test for automaticity before moving on to the next skill. So a skill has become automatic when it can be performed well or when it doesn't degrade when the conscious mind is focused on something else. And a good example of this, uh, which most people can relate to, is driving. So anyone who's been driving for a bit is able to drive from one location to another, if it's a route that they know, while doing other things like carrying on a conversation or daydreaming and so on. So they're able to carry out all the mechanics of driving while their conscious mind is focused on other things. But if you look at a new driver, you'll appreciate that there are many different micro skills that have to be learned in order to drive. And before you've learned them, you have to focus your conscious mind on them or else you'll crash. And with practice, those skills become automatic or subconscious, which allows you to drive while no longer paying attention to them. So the same principle should be applied when learning music. As you add new skills, you want to make sure that they become automatic before you move to the next skill. And there are a couple of really nice ways with music that you can test for automaticity. So one of those is with the metronome. In my opinion, the metronome, uh, while it's a good tool for practicing timing, is really good as a test for automaticity. Because in order to successfully play along and in time with a metronome, your conscious mind has to focus on the clicks of the metronome, which means that what you're playing along with it must be automatic, uh, since, the, since your conscious mind is otherwise occupied. So if you had to focus on uh, if you have to focus on both the clicks of the metronome and on what you're playing, you won't be able to play along with it. And if you aren't, then that's a cue that whatever it is you're working on needs more practice and attention before you should move to the next skill. On the other hand, if your playing doesn't degrade while you're playing with the metronome or a backing track or another musician, then it's a good indication that the skill has become automatic and has moved from the conscious mind to the unconscious mind. So, <clears throat> relatedly, the next big mistake that folks make, which is really, really common, is to move on to more complex skills too soon, or to have no system for understanding or knowing when to move on. The third key is to find and focus on your weaknesses. So the research shows that the biggest difference between those who reach high levels of expertise and those who don't is in how they practice. <clears throat> and the big difference between effective and ineffective learners appears to be how much time they spend on the things they already know well versus how much time they spend on their weaknesses. So experts, or people who've reached expertise, spend hardly any time on things they know well but they focus relentlessly on their weaknesses. And this is true of experts in any field. They're always looking for areas in need of improvement, and they understand that failure and finding points of failure is essential to the learning process. Whereas others tend to go through the same practice routine over and over again, needlessly spending time on things they already know how to do with little or no time spent on their weaknesses, or even worse, little to no awareness, awareness of what those weaknesses are. So this is, here's an illustration of why it's unnecessary to spend a lot of time on the things you've already learned. So this is something known as the forgetting curve, and it comes from memory research. Basically, every time you form a new memory, it starts out unstable, uh, which means that it starts to degrade over time. But if you revisit that memory, you can boost it back up. If you don't revisit it again, it'll eventually go away. And there's also kind of an ideal time window for revisiting, uh, revisiting that memory, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, I have, have an article that I'll add to the description that um, you can click on that talks more about that. Um, but after you revisit it, it starts to degrade again, 
but it's, it degrades at a slower at a slower rate. And then you revisit it again, it degrades at an even slower rate until it ultimately come, becomes very stable and it hardly degrades at all over time. And at that point, the memory is yours. And that's kind of when it's hit that transition uh, to becoming automatic. So it's literally become a permanent structure inside the brain. And once you've reached that point uh, where it's no longer degrading over time and it's become stable, you'll see that there's really no need to keep revisiting that memory in order for it to stay with you. So any time that's spent continuing to work on it is wasted time and effort. So as far as focusing on weaknesses goes, one of my favorite things here is what I call the labyrinth technique. So the, the name for this technique comes from uh, the game Labyrinth. So a while back I was playing this with my son who was about seven at the time and uh, we were seeing who could make it the furthest. So uh, for those who uh, aren't familiar with the game, uh, you, you place a marble at the starting point and then um, using the knobs on the side which can adjust the pitch of the board, you try to maneuver the um, marble all around the, uh, the, the path that's shown to the end uh, without letting the marble fall into one of the, one of the holes. So as we were playing the game, there was this one section that kept tripping me up, um, which you can see with the uh, arrow there. So I'd, I'd start at the beginning, and I'd get all the way to that section, and then I'd fall in that same hole every time. And then it dawned on me that all I really needed to do was work on that little, uh, that little part. So instead of starting all the way at the beginning, I placed my marble down right in front of the tricky section and worked on just the maneuvers that I needed to make it through. And it didn't take me very long after doing this to, to get those down. So before I adopted that approach, I was essentially wasting all this time practicing the parts of the maze that I already knew how to do, with very little time spent practicing the thing that I hadn't learned how to do. And I think this is a great example of how the way you practice can make such a difference in the speed and the effectiveness of the learning process. So if you were to imagine two people learning the banjo and they're at the same stage in their journey. They're both struggling over the same phrase in a particular piece of music. And one guy practices the entire song every time. So it takes him five minutes to play through the song and then he, he, he or to play through and get to the part that he doesn't know well. And then he kind of rushes through, through that part, just trying to get through it. So over the course of a 20 minute session, he practices it four times. And when he does so, he kind of reinforces some bad habits. There's another guy realizes that he knows the rest of the song well, so he only should practice that one phrase that he's struggling with. So it takes him about 30 seconds to practice it, so he repeats it in a loop using the labyrinth technique. And so he practices it 40 times. By the next day, he's going to be much further along in the process of that part becoming automatic than the other guy. And you can see that over time, these two players, if they continue these same approaches, despite having started in the same place, will be at very different skill levels in short, in short order. And that's entirely on account of the way in which they're practicing. So the next key is to work on the smallest learnable skill. So research shows that the effective way to learn any complex skill or behavior is to break it down into the smallest learnable chunks and then to learn those chunks in the proper sequence. And if you try learning multiple skills at the same time before they've become automatic, you're much more likely to end up with error-prone and inefficient neural networks, making continued progress uh, biologically impossible. And most of the time, in the typical instruction, you have multiple components that are being taught simultaneously without much consideration as to the proper order or the, or the smallest learn, learnable chunk that can be taught. And that brings me to the next mistake, which is trying to work on multiple new skills at the same time. And I think this has become an especially big problem in the world of bluegrass or Scruggs-style banjo. So some of you may be familiar with the Earl Scruggs and the Five String Banjo book. And it's a wonderful resource and I love the book. But one of the things it does is almost immediately go straight to playing roles or patterns of, of picking. And there are many reasons why this is not a good idea. But one of the big ones is that there are about a dozen individual skills required to do that well. And out of the gate, you're trying to learn all of them at once. 
So that's a recipe for disaster for the reasons that I've talked about. And in my opinion, it's one of the main reasons there's such a high, high fa failure rate when it cr comes to uh, Scruggs or bluegrass style banjo. And the problem is that the book and that particular approach has been very influential. And so most of the instruction that's been created uh, for uh, bluegrass and finger style banjo has been based on that book and those particular ideas. The next key is to use your zombies, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So one of the biggest breakthroughs in the world of behavioral neuroscience and cognition in the past couple decades is our realization that much of our behavior and most of the workings of our brain doesn't happen consciously. So if we go back to the child learning language or learning other human behaviors like walking and social interactions, none of that uh, learning occurred by any direct instruction. So it didn't happen in a classroom through any formal or direct learning. Uh, there wasn't any class on learning how to talk. All of the learning was happening subconsciously beneath the child's awareness through these incredibly sophisticated subconscious circuits. And a big part of that was the brain filtering the sounds of the child's native tongue and building a vast library of sonic chunks of that language so that it, so that it could then start mapping the movements of the vocal cords onto those sonic chunks. And all of this again being done beneath the child's conscious awareness. Now we're really biased towards thinking that uh, our practice and getting better at anything and learning music only happens when we're consciously wor working on it. But the reality is that much of our learning, perhaps most of it, is occurring beneath conscious awareness. And certainly a lot of it is happening when we're not practicing. So. Our brain will figure out a lot of this stuff for us if we give it the right kind of inputs. And where this is most relevant uh, for a musician is in the importance of listening. So because there's no effort involved you typically with listening, people are inclined to overlook just how important it is in the learning process. And the idea here is to not only you know, listen to the sound of your instrument and the genre you want to play, but also to find players who really inspire you. And the most uh, helpful listening is in, fire, in finding players whose playing really resonates with you and then listen to those players obsessively for a while. And you'll find this kind of thing is really common across you know, every master player. They all had a person or persons whose playing they really admired and who they spent a lot of time listening to. So I'd encourage you to be very intentional about this and to start building your own personal library of, of music of people whose playing you most enjoy. And what will happen is that over time, as your, skill, as your technical skill set improves and as your ear develops, your brain will start to build these connections between the sounds you really like and the movement of your fingers and your limbs. And one of the things that illustrates this idea of all these things happening in the brain beneath our awareness and that so much of learning is subconscious is that people often note that after a bit of a break from the banjo or from any musical instrument that their playing has actually uh, seemed to have improved. And that's because the brain is still working on stuff even when you're not you know, formally or consciously working on it. So the brain is churning on the problems you've given it to solve even when you're not consciously focusing on them. There are all these uh, circuits that are being modified and molded underneath your awareness. And so what you want to do is provide the brain with the inputs or the raw materials it needs to create those circuits. The next key is to mind your practice time. So learning anything new and forming any new memory requires the brain to change. And if our brain doesn't change from one day to the next, we can't lay down any new memories, which means we can't learn anything new. So we'd be the exact same person day to day if our brain doesn't change in any way. So with no new memories or no new experiences stored. But changing the brain comes with a cost. So forming new circuits and creating new synapses and growing new neurons takes energy and that's metabolically expensive. And organisms that waste energy don't survive very long. So that means that the brain isn't going to devote energy and resources to changing itself unless it thinks something is important enough to do so. 
And so this is why the majority of the, the events of your day go unremembered. It's because the brain has said that there isn't a real need to create new brain parts to remember it. It's not worth the energy cost of doing so. On the other hand, there are some things that you do remember. So the brain must have some sort of mechanism or a way of deciding what's important enough to spend energy on to lay down a new memory for and what's okay to forget. And so if the most of the sensory input that your brain takes in over the course of the day is forgotten, how exactly does your brain decide what gets remembered? And the primary me mechanism in the brain for doing this is focus and attention. So in an article I wrote a while back for the Banjo newsletter, I referred to attention as the gatekeeper of plasticity. So meaning that your brain isn't going to change in response to something or form a new memory unless you're playing close to paying close attention to it. And as a side note, I think this is one reason why uh, memory complaints are so common these days is because our attention is more divided than ever and we're spending less time with that single-minded focus and attention that's needed to signal the brain that it should change and form a new memory uh, in response to our experiences. So attention is how you signal your brain that something is important enough to change for. So how does this apply to the banjo player? Well, when you're practicing, especially practicing new things, um, if you actually want to signal your brain to change, then you must focus. That means removing distractions and focusing all your attention on that one thing. The good news is that it doesn't take very long. So research shows that it takes about 15 to 20 minutes of focus on one thing uh, to send that change signal. And that's enough to provide enough to provide the needed inputs for the brain to make changes. And that brings me to the next mistake, which is actually practicing too long. So research shows that most people can only sustain high levels of focus in increments of about 20 or 25 minutes, and then they need a break. And if you continue past that mark and your attention starts to fade, so does the quality of your practice. And now the inputs that you're giving the brain to base its changes on aren't as good. And it's common for people to think that more practice is always better. But it's very easy to do more harm than good with too much practice, especially if it's low quality. So the goal here really is to aim for quality over quantity. Like I said, it doesn't take that much to, to, to send the signal that your brain needs to change. And there's only so much change that, that the brain can do over the course of a day. So we want to aim for about 20 minutes of directed attention when working on new things. And if we want to do more than this, then give yourself a break and uh, break everything into these smaller 20 to 25 minute chunks. And there are even timers or apps on the computer that you can use for this particular purpose to remind you uh, to, to stop when the, when the time is up. The next key is to build sound to motor networks. So the ultimate objective in learning an instrument, especially in the traditions that, uh, like the banjo, is to build sound to motor networks. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So if we look at an expert musician, the ultimate skill that they've developed is musical fluency, or the ability to take musical ideas and translate those quickly uh, into the movement of the arms and hands to produce those imagined sounds on their instrument. And this is analogous to fluency in language, which is the ability to take imagined ideas or concepts and translate those into movements of the vocal cords so that those ideas are translated into speech. Now for a musician, the goal is then to take any musical thought and play it on the instrument. And in the brain, what's happening is you're taking that musical thought and immediately mapping it onto a program for how to move the muscles so that that thought is realized in the sound of an instrument. And so the uh, brain joke course is designed in large part with this end goal in mind of creating the networks that support this type of fluency. And so all of the networks that are being built along the way are ultimately wor working towards supporting that goal. And you'll notice what's missing here in this definition of, of uh, fluency, and, that there, and that's that there's no represent, representation of notation or any written system of describing music in those networks. So, and this is what I referenced before. It's totally different than what the brain of an expert classical musician must do. 
So the expert classical musician can take notation on a page and instantly translate that into movement of the limbs to create the sounds that the, that notation represents. So they have what we might call vision to motor networks for translating visual information into movement of their limbs and then into music. And if we were to com compare uh, what a classical musician would be doing to, uh, to learning language, it's more analogous to learning how to look at the words on the page and read them out loud. Whereas in traditions like the banjo, the goal is more analogous to being able to carry on a conversation. So that's why it makes a little sense to use the teaching methods of classical music when we're trying to uh, accomplish something that's very different. And oftentimes um, this sort of thing gets misconstrued is meaning that you should never uh, use notation or tab uh, in the learning process. But I don't think that's true at all. I think that uh, notation and tab can be very useful and uh, can still uh, be an aid in helping to, you to reach uh, fluency. In fact, so, in some cases it can help you reach it faster um, because uh, notation and tab is a helpful tool for communicating musical ideas clearly. But the key is just in being careful about how you use it. And so the reason why people who depend a lot on tab end up getting stuck is because there isn't a deliberate effort to keep the tab out of their banjo playing uh, neural networks. So in other words, you don't want notation or tab to get baked into your playing circuits. If you're going to learn something from tab, there are specific ways to do so um, so that you don't end up integrating it into those uh, banjo playing networks. So that brings us to the next mistake, which is integrating musical notation into your banjo playing circuits. Once this has happened, it's kind of a hard thing to recover from because it, because it requires you to kind of go back and relearn things in a new way. And we don't ever like going backwards. Um, and some of the signs that kind of you're starting to create this sort of dependence on notation or tab is that if you find that you can't play a tune any way but the way you originally learned it, or you find that you can kind of play it fine when you're on your own, but it falls apart when you're trying to play it with others like in a jam. So I use tab quite a bit in the uh, Brainjo and the Breakthrough Brainjo course materials, but I also take um, deliberate steps to try to ensure that it enhances the pro learning process and doesn't interfere with our ultimate goal of developing fluency. And um, there are also some specific things you can do to help reinforce those sound to motor mappings uh, independent of tab. And um, that brings me to the next key, which is to use the force. And uh, by force, I'm referring to visualization. So even though I've understood the science behind uh, visualization and have used it myself for quite some time, I still find the whole thing a little bit magical. And in the article that I wrote on this topic a few years ago for the Banjo Newsletter, I talked about visualization being the closest, closest thing that we humans have to being able to use the force or the ability to control things in the physical world um, using just our minds. Because basically what you can do with visualization is just through your thoughts alone, transform the structure of your brain in some pretty profound ways. And one of the most remarkable things about visualization is that when it's used well, you get almost the same benefits, if not the same benefits in some circumstances, as if you'd actually practiced with your instrument. And we know this from multiple experiences that have been done on it. So for example, in one, in one experiment, there were subjects who, were, who didn't know how to play the piano, were divided into three groups, and then taught a series of playing exercises. One group just practiced normally at a certain uh, interval, a practice interval. One group just visualized themselves practicing at the same interval, and then one group didn't practice at all. And then they, after the uh, study was finished, they looked at how well they learned, and they used a tool for assessing how much the brain had changed. And what they found was that both the physical and the visualization practice groups improved by equal amounts, and much more so than the group that didn't practice, not surprising. But what was even cooler was that they also saw the same structural changes in the brains of both groups, in the part of the brain in involving uh, controlling the hand and finger movements. So just thinking about an activity activates the same brain regions as performing that activity, and so also stimulates the same sorts of changes that you get from practice. 
And so that's why you can get nearly the same benefits with visual with, with uh, visualizing yourself practice as you can from actually practicing with your instrument. The key here is that you must use a first person's perspective when you're doing this. So you don't want to use a third person perspective, which is kind of watching yourself practice, but you want to actually visualize as if you're holding a banjo. Um, so if this is not something you've ever done before, I think there's, there's a um, helpful exercise I'll give you. So imagine yourself right now uh, grabbing a pen in the hand that you usually use to sign your name. And then imagine yourself signing your name and feeling the movements of your hand just as you would in real life. Now, after you've done that, imagine picking up that pen with the hand that you don't usually use uh, to sign your name, your non-dominant hand, and then also try to, to uh, sign your name. And if you have the right idea, what you'll find is that in the first instance, when you're using your dominant hand, it'll feel normal and easy. And in the second instance, when you're visualizing yourself signing with your non-dominant hand, it'll feel very awkward, just as it would in real life, unless you're ambidextrous and you write with both hands. Um, so if you experience that awkward sensation, then you have the right idea with visualization. Um, another thing you might try doing is imagining yourself you know, cutting a piece of steak with a knife and fork, first with your, the, the hands you normally do it, and then reverse the hands and again, you should be able to feel that same amount of awkwardness that you'd feel in real life if you try to do that. So there are a couple of scenarios where visualization works really well. Um, the first is kind of combined with the labyrinth technique that I spoke about earlier. So if there's a particular phrase or technique that you're struggling with, you can practice just that little chunk in your mind. And if you do it right, you'll likely make the same mistakes um, when you visualize that you'd make in real life or when you're playing the instrument. So just as you would when you're uh, actually playing, try to practice it in your mind slow enough to, act, to play it right. And if you want to kind of further enhance the impact of this technique, try doing this right before you go to sleep. One of the primary functions of sleep is to learn and to lay down new memories. And we know that the brain prioritizes things you've done closer to sleep when it's forming those new memories. So this is one reason why watching a show uh, late at night will tend to influence your dreams more than something you may have done earlier in the day or in the morning. So if you briefly visualize at bedtime or even when falling to sleep, you can kind of give your brain a cue that you want it to work on that thing. Um, this can also be a good technique for just falling asleep. And the second way to use visualization is to help you build and reinforce those sound to motor mappings in a way that you can't get with physical practice. So I mentioned previously that musical fluency depends on the creation of these sound to motor networks or sound to motor mappings in the brain. So guess what? When you're visualizing something, the idea is for you to visualize the movements uh, and hear the sound of the banjo as you're making those movements. And the only way you're able to link those two things together when visualizing is if you have, have those sound to motor mappings in the brain, if you're able to connect the sounds in your mind to the movements of your limbs. And so by visualizing, you're reinforcing those mappings and transforming them into long-term memories. And this is a really helpful step towards learning to play by ear and improvise and so on. And Another um, really neat way to use this technique is to record yourself playing something you know well and then play it back and as you're playing it back just visualize yourself playing it. Um, and then if there's a part you can't quite visualize as it's playing back or know what you're supposed to be doing with your hands, um, go back to the banjo and figure that out and then try it again. Uh, one of the reasons this particular technique with recording yourself works so well is that when you listen to a recording of yourself that you've made, you almost can't help but imagine yourself playing it when you do that. Um, and so it's a really great and almost effortless way to get started with visualization and to start reinfo reinforcing those sound to motor networks that you're trying to build. The next key is to try to always have material that you want to play that's right for your level. So I've talked before about how, how important it is to break this process down into the smallest learnable chunks. But at the same time, the most motivating thing when learning, the, learning banjo is being able to play music. The good thing about this 
is that even with just a few simple techniques under, under your belt, you can start playing great sounding stuff on the banjo. But what you don't want to do, as the preceding discussion should make clear, is to start trying to play arrangements that use skills and techniques that you've yet to fully develop. So to take the example of the um, Earl Scruggs and the Five String Banjo book, it goes from learning roles to then trying to learn arrangements just like Earl played them. Now these are the things he was playing after decades of experience. And again, that's a recipe for disaster if that's the only music you've been given to try to learn. So you'll be trying to incorporate skills and techniques that you've never learned before. And that's the perfect way to start building those low quality neural networks that end up making stagnation inevitable. And this is a problem with so much um, instruction is that you're given one arrangement of a given tune without kind of a consideration for where you're at in your learning journey and whether or not it's actually appropriate for you. So oftentimes it's kind of the most complex or fully formed version of the tune or one you might hear you know, on an album and many times just something you're not ready for. Um, so that brings me to the next mistake, which is trying to learn arrangements that are beyond your current level. So <clears throat> it's really important to have music you can play all along the way, but you also want to make sure that it only incorporates the skills and techniques you've already learned well or that you're currently working on. And if you've seen um, the arrangements that, I've, that I give out, they all have the uh, Brainjo level de designation, uh, and there's a system so you can uh, understand what the different levels mean. That way you can know if it's something that you're ready for or not. Um, it's also the reason in the courses that I try really hard to create really good sounding arrangements for any skill level. Um, so even if you just have a, a few basic techniques, um, you'll, you can continue to make great music and stay motivated. And honestly, um, those first tunes that you play are just as enjoyable as the most complex or the more complex expert level ones. Um, one of the secrets about this whole uh, learning process and learning the banjo is that I think every step along the way is just as enjoyable as the last. So I had just as much fun playing uh, when I first got started as I do now, um, after I'm a lot better. And it's really progress or improvement, no matter where you're at, that's the most rewarding thing. And so having a way of ensuring continued progress is the way to always keep things fun and rewarding. And it's when people stop progressing that they stop having fun and when they're most likely to give up. So um, one of the features of the uh, Breakthrough Banjo courses is the Vault, which is a um, large library of songs and tunes arranged in multiple genres and at multiple levels so that folks um, will always have access to music to learn that's inspiring and also appropriate for their level. And so they're not tempted to try to learn things that are out of reach, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, a recipe for, for building bad habits like we talked about. So, it's very important to be mindful of having learning material that's right for your level. Which brings me to the last mistake, which is simply not being mindful of the importance of how you practice. So hopefully I've impressed upon you that number one, uh, reaching your goals and continuing to improve depends entirely on how you practice and not on any type of innate ability. And so being mindful of the importance of how you practice is critical to making steady progress and to reaching your musical goals. All right, so that is it. Um, hopefully I've given you a lot to think about. Um, and hopefully uh, going through this, all this allows you to understand just how important it is to pay attention to the learning process and how many different avenues there are for accelerating that process. Um, and we're still learning new things all the time about, you know, best ways to learn and best ways to change the brain and ways we want it to change. And so as we continue to learn new things, I'll continue to share them with you folks and uh, also continue to incorporate them into the courses that are based on the Brainjo method. So um, if you'd like to learn more about the Breakthrough Banjo courses, uh, which are now available for fingerstyle and claw hammer banjo, um, place, I'll place links in the video description, the um, fingerstyle course, you can learn more about it, fingerstylebanjo.com, and the clawhammer course at clawhammerbanjo.net um, forward slash breakthrough. So thanks again for joining me today. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed it, 
Now uh, go pick some banjo.